Yes, let me ask you because you you really have seen the evolution of the of our code and the design provisions. Um, if you um, and certainly, I mean, these codes in different countries, I mean, they are being upgraded. There is a 1950s, 60s, 70s, versions, and so on. Um, is there a time period that, in your opinion, you would say that really we knew, we learned everything, that most everything that we should know to prevent the major damages? And unfortunately, I mean, as you know, we, we do lots of research to... Uh, figure out how we should design different elements of the buildings and the bridges in the earthquake zones. And what the uh, proof of concept test is, is the uh, earthquakes. The earthquakes really put everything that we, we believe that's going to work to the test. And then we learn from it and then we modify our codes and the design provisions. Um, is there a time period that you would say really if uh, uh, we, we know for most parts of them what we should do so that uh, we design our buildings and the bridges so that they don't collapse, they don't sustain too much damage. And, and uh, is there a time period that you would say, really, uh, that's, you can pinpoint, and that, that will tie into the, uh, what design code really, the revisions, is uh, if you design based, you should be minimizing the, the damage. I, I think uh, let's talk in terms of a, a number of what I consider to be milestones. So the if you start in the 50s, uh, 1959 was the year that the Structural Engineers Association of California published their first so-called blue book, recommended lateral force uh, requirements. And, and that, <clears throat> I, I think, uh, changed structural engineering in the United States. Uh, there were building codes before, but, but this document had incredible influence over the size of right. in the country. Uh, right after that, in my mind, this is a huge milestone that is not uh, well recognized. Uh, Bloom, Newmark, Corning, uh, John Bloom, Nathan Newmark. Uh, John Bloom was a California-based practitioner, very highly regarded. Professor Nathan Newmark, University of Illinois, one of the pioneers of artwork engineering. And Leo Corning at that time was a PCA, Portland Cement Association executive. PCA published a book by the three of them in 1961, which to me is, is, is a huge milestone. That book told us how to detail reinforced concrete structures. Uh, earthquake design, as you well know, has two parts. You, you have to provide a certain level of strength, but you also, we, we never provide uh, enough strength that a structure will not sustain damage in the earthquake that we are designing for, because that would be prohibitively expensive. So we design for a lower strength but we, we absolutely want to make sure that while the structure sustains damage, it doesn't collapse on us. So that's where the other part comes in. Uh, it, it goes by various names, ductility, inelastic deformation capacity. I don't go in, want to go into technicalities, but the idea is that a, a structure will be able to sustain damage while still carrying full factor gravity loads. Uh, this requires uh, detailing how we arrange the reinforcement in a concrete structure. Uh, the, the, the reinforcement that runs along the member, so called longitudinal reinforcement, equally more importantly, transverse reinforcement that, that, 
the reinforcement that ties together the longitudinal reinforcement. Anyway, before the Newmark book, we did not know for, for uh, the real earthquake resistance what kind of detailing we should be doing. Uh, that that book uh, in in itself did not change things. A, a, a few knowledgeable people started applying it, but then came a a real landmark event: the the 1971 San Bernardo earthquake. For U.S. seismic engineering, I think that was the biggest. Uh, event that changed things. A, a lot of damage uh, that much of it or most of it could be at, attributable to the lack of this, this ductility in the structures. So, so buildings just uh, just collapsed and crumbled where they shouldn't have. That, that you know, it is never one factor as I as I keep on saying, but but non-ductile concrete structures, as we call them, uh, was a big contributor to what happened. So the uh, back then the dominant seismic code was the uniform building code. That was the code adopted by the western half of the country where earthquakes were more frequent. Uh, these days we have the international building code that is adopted by the whole country. Back then there were three regional codes, uh, uniform building code for the west, the OCA national building code for the northeast, and the standard building code for the southeast. For wind provisions, standard building code was the dominant code because wind was a problem in the southeast. And for earthquakes, uniform building code was the code. Uh, anyway, 1973 UBC, as we typically call it, uh, made huge changes in concrete detailing, uh, mostly influenced by the Bloom New Recording Book. And there is a world of difference between post-1973 and pre-1973 concrete structures. So, so that, I think, was a huge landmark. Then uh, 1978 is the year when another, uh, I'm using the same word over and over, Another landmark document was published, ATC3, which I'm sure you, are, you, you know a lot about. Uh, this was recommended, uh, what was it called? Uh, recommended building core provisions for buildings and other structures, some such. Uh, anyway, this was the beginning of a national, a set of national earthquake regulations as opposed to regional. Uh, this document underwent uh, a, a lot of scrutiny and, and then uh, it is the predecessor document to the NARP provisions, NEHRP, National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program provisions, which are now routinely adopted by the the loading standard AC7, uh, which in turn is adopted by the building code. Uh, so the way we, we design for earthquakes today started with the ATC3 document dated 1978. That was the beginning of, if you want to call it, modern seismic design. So I, I would say when I look back, the decade of the 70s is when we probably did more learning than any other decade that I can think of. Yeah. That, that was a, that was huge, yeah. huge. Uh, 80s, uh, not so much. The, the biggest thing that happened in the 80s, I think, is the 1988 edition of the building code switched to 
strength design for earthquakes. And up until then, we used to do allowable stress design, which did not make a lot of sense. Well, what is a service level earthquake? You know, but, but that's how we used to approach it. And, and then uh, when the 80s ended, 90s uh, came, uh, I, <laughs> the, the biggest event was the 1994 Northridge earthquake, again, uh, uh, <clears throat> the Los Angeles area. Just prior to the 90s, as the 80s were ending, there was the so-called Loma Prieta earthquake, San Francisco area. That was the day of the uh, World Series ball game. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, and right after 94 Northridge was the Kobe earthquake of 95. The San Francisco earthquake taught us a lesson that we learned in the Mexico earthquake of 1985, the importance, extreme importance of soft soil. Soft soil. That, that was, I think, the, the <laughs> that, that was driven home to us in the 80s to the point that it couldn't be ignored anymore. We had to, we had to adjust our codes in, rec in recognition of that. And then the Northridge earthquake, the biggest thing was the, the, uh, the moment frame of, of steel, the special moment frame of steel, as we call special, meaning specially detailed, which was widely regarded as the Cadillac of structural systems. That turned out to be vulnerable, uh, the, 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 the beam column joint, uh, uh, the way it was designed, was found to be deficient and uh, remedies were developed by research. But, but that was, that was a, a huge lesson that the 94 earthquake taught us. Uh, and, and then uh, 2000 onwards, I would say we are, <laughs> else? Also, let's say. Do you think 94, uh, uh, seems like that's a time that it came to the surface the uh, the owner uh, not knowing that the buildings that they have may sustain the damage beyond the repair in fact the special moment is the same thing that you mentioned that uh, so the, the owners would they were uh, some owners were under the impression that i have a building that's going to last and i'm not going to i'm going to be able to use it all of a sudden they face this situation that hey I'm going to be, uh, uh, I may even have to abandon or the, the repair is going to be huge. Yeah, you know, the part, communication part of it, the and the, yeah, part of it was, we obviously could not tell people what we did not know. The beam column joint of uh, special steel frames, engineers thought were, totally adequate so they couldn't have uh, warned, the, warned the owners but the rest of it is that we as a profession are poor at communication we we have never uh, <laughs> adequately informed either building owners building occupants or the news media yeah. that we design our buildings to sustain damage in the so-called design earthquake, the earthquake that is expected to hit our structure every so many years. Okay. And, and uh, the, 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 this failure to communicate has meant yeah. that after every earthquake that the, the media, you know, uh, criticize, <laughs> you know, things are, things should have been better. No, most of the time buildings in, in recent earthquakes, recent times, uh, post-1973 buildings, I would say, have more or less performed up to expectation. So, okay. 